Um, well, uh, it's super exciting for me to see, in air quotes, all of you here. You know, I really miss the opportunity to be doing this with all of you out on the beach. And, um, you know, and what's really kind of heartening to me is to actually see all these, the different uh, programs able to come together and kind of share in an experience. So um, I'm thrilled to be here and just kind of share my uh, insights and actually share a really cool spot that uh, I enjoy going to, a lot of families enjoy going to. It's an important place for monitoring uh, and both for Sea Grant and the Crab Team as well as um, uh, the Vachon Nature Center which Bianca talked about and um, it's just a very unique place and um, uh, it's got a long history that I'll share just a little bit of and then we'll try to share some of the sea life we're working off a phone here, so um, uh, video and image quality will be kind of limited. So I don't know that we'll be doing lots of close-ups of critters, but um, hopefully I can give you kind of an idea of what we, what we have here. So um, first I'll actually, and you also see me wiggling my fingers as I turn things around, but I'll show you the, the opening to, the, uh, to this uh, Rob's Lagoon. And, if I put my finger right there, there's a bald eagle sitting there right now, which is a common place to find them. One of the reasons they're here is because of these Canada geese and all their cute little babies who are actually good fodder for uh, eagles this time of year. Um, but it's actually a really cool spot for birds. Uh, there's usually a Caspian tern fishing uh, for small fish in here. And uh, and also uh, there was an osprey hunting when I came came down here earlier. So neat place for that. Also, um, I'll just share a few things about it that, uh, that I think are kind of cool. And also a big shout out to uh, King County for uh, allowing us, King County Parks for allowing us to come out here and use this place for monitoring um, uh, for crab team. It's, it's a real treasure and you know something that we, uh, it's really makes uh, contributions of these um, types of places, uh, much bigger, bigger programs sound wide. Um, sorry, turn my camera here. Um, anyway, the, um, let's see, I also, um, you know, a big shout out to uh, Amy and the team kind of putting this on. It's no small feat and appreciate all of you kind of helping and uh, being patient with all the technical um, and the VNC, the Vashon Nature Center for uh, kind of being stewards out here in this area. Um, and all of you for being here. Uh, this park actually was purchased in 2008, so a little over a decade ago, or uh, acquired by uh, King County with the help of the Vashon uh, Morita Land Trust and the Cascade Land Conservancy, uh, recognizing its importance. Um, and I think it's also important to, when we kind of think about the history of this place, to recognize the people who uh, lived here long before us. It's uh, been acknowledged that the the tribes have been, um, the Salish tribes have been on Fashon Mori for 2,500 years. came 150 members were thought to be here on the islands and uh, these places were um, were uh, special to them I don't know are you able to put up some of the maps while we're talking here so we'll we'll give you a, a just a shot of um, kind of the regional image what it looks like here so We'll give it a try. Yes. If that if that part fails, I'll talk us through it. I'll also say that a, the mask is very helpful for social distancing and for holding a microphone so the wind uh, Perfect. It's up, Amy. It is too much. Hey, excellent. All right. So um, red dot kind of down toward the bottom is, is on that Maury Island. That's uh, Rob's Lagoon. Uh, we'll zoom in here. Uh, so the next one, next map. if you can. I sure hey. can. <laughs> Sorry, it's really bright out here. Ah. <laughs> 
So there's several maps and some of them are kind of, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of T sheets, but these are maps from like the eight, late 1800s that really are, they're publicly accessible to UW, but they have, they're really neat for actually looking at the shorelines historically. So if you go a lagoon there, you can see a spit coming across the front of it. Um, and that spit is different now, I'll show you, uh, show you later. And actually we can go to the next map and you can see how, uh, what that modification looks like um, over time. So I think there's the, actually you can just go to the next, uh, to the new satellite map, that'd be awesome. The third map is actually showing what we have right now, which is um, as I, um, us here, and if you want to put me back on, I'll I'll spin around and show it. So uh, late right around the turn of the century, um, they built a, a causeway on pilings all around the shoreline here, um, and fifties the Washington Fish and Wildlife actually built a dam uh, to raise the water level and to hold hold salmon here. So, so the Chinook here for a few years, uh, uh, juveniles in to grow them out and let them go out to sea and come back. Um, and of course, this isn't prime Chinook habitat. So they actually didn't establish a population as they were hoping. But, um, there's the one reason that we've got the um, kind of the lagoon, more of a lagoon habitat than probably it was historically. Um, but it is interesting, the Rocky Spillway over here that we'll take a look at actually has um, some really, uh, really good rocky habitat for looking at stuff. And, um, and the higher water level has created Um, excuse this. me. Yes. Um, you said the higher. You cut out when you said the higher level creates. Okay. Great. Um, Can you so repeat higher, that? Thank you. <laughs> no. Thank. Thanks for asking. The higher water level actually creates a lot of habitat, and one of the things we'll look at here is um, the sand dollars. There's a pretty significant sand dollar community here. Um, there's also pools of. Um, there's a, a large pool here that gets forage fish in it. So I'm going to walk down here. I want to show you um, some of the crab team activities for a minute, if that's OK. Um, this is our sign that we have that says that we're out trapping. And there's also a rope laid here, which is part of our habitat monitoring. And we collect. Uh, traps as well as crab molts and I can share with you um, kind of the last trap. The uh, one of the cool things is that there were um, uh, there were a large number of pipe fish in here and um, I don't know it, it, I wish I could ask you if anyone knew what a pipe fish was but I'll, I'll have, just have to say that it's actually a seahorse and it's really kind of cool that we were able to uh, to get um, to have to see a seahorse around here. Sadly, they're skinny and they just swam right out of the nets, so I can't show them to you. But you might look up the bay pipefish and actually uh, learn a little bit about it, because just like seahorses, the males uh, brood the eggs, um, and the uh, this guy out. Um, and the uh, ah, it's good. the males brood the eggs, and they just don't curl like the seahorse you're used to seeing in uh, on TV, the more tropical ones. So I'm actually emptying this trap called a fakui trap, and I wanted to show you the, some of the bigger crabs that we caught here. So I don't know. Can you see this? Okay. Does it look okay in the image? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this is a, a female graceful crab. Some of you may have seen it and thought it was a Dungeness crab. 
looking like this. This is a male graceful crab. And uh, these are, you know, they're in the main basin of Puget Sound. They're much more common generally than, than the uh, uh, Dungeness, but they look super similar. They're very close cousins. And uh, the diff one of the differences is in the number of spines. They, um, they actually have, they all have 10 spines, but the graceful crab has a spine right back here, sort of around the end. For any of you crab harvesters out there, you know that you measure out to the widest point. But uh, just male and female, you know, if you look at their abdomens, you know, you can see the kind of lighthouse on the male. That's the abdomen folded up underneath. And I know a lot of you are uh, familiar with this, but uh, I don't know if you can and certainly want to share it with anybody who's uh, not used to them. You can see a big difference on this female. She's got a much larger abdomen. And that's, she can hold a lot of eggs. And sometimes this time of year, you'll see, you'll start seeing um, some of the females on the beach with their abdomen, egg, egg, with their abdomens ripped off. The eggs. Those are the graceful crabs, which are a couple of eggs. And this is probably one of our most cantankerous uh, bigger crab, kelp crab. Also a big part of the story for our law of uh, bull kelp. Um, in the sound where there's some kelp just clinging on, you'll find uh, um, you'll find some of these just clinging all over and feeding off the kelp. But they're aggressive, uh, aggressive feeders on everything. And this is a big boy. Um, and also it's kind of, you can tell, if you noticed on this, maybe you see a barnacle there. So uh, that's telling you that this, this crab's getting pretty far along and it's, it's molt and either they're, or in its shell, either they're gonna molt again soon or, uh, or, uh, or actually it could be a terminal molt if they're big enough. So yeah, I wanted to share those with you. I'll let them go. Try not to drop my phone. And this one actually had some cool stuff in it. I don't know if you'll be able to see. I can't empty it right now, but um, so this is a minnow trap. This is the other type of trap we, we use. And what I wanted to share was that there's a, uh, there's some mission here. Well, I think I can open this up. Give me just a second here. If there are any, actually, I think I heard the voice of some teamer. For sure. And this is a pretty small catch, but it's a pretty fun one. Um, we have our classic um, hairy shore crab, which is a big part of what we find. Um, and actually, it's 97% of what we find. In, or 90, low 90s or mid high 90s, I can't remember, but um, it's really the dominant thing we find. And then this is the second most dominant. This is a, a stag horn sculpin, um, named which because, named stag horn because of the, oh, get it there, because of the uh, kind of plates that come out um, and the, the hooks on the operculum or the gill covers. They're actually shaped a bit like a, a stag's horn. Um, whoops, there he goes. And then what I thought was really cool in this one was this, uh, this gunnel. Beautiful, beautiful fish. Um, and in crab team, we call them eel-like fishes because there's several species that are pretty hard to This one looks like a crescent, but a little out of practice. Um, just a beautiful fish. And for any of you who have ever done a um, uh, beach sanding and have measured these things, you might know how wily they are. Um, they're very, very smooth skinned and just don't stop moving. So anyway, a very cool collection of critters. Um, and I'm going to give them some fresh water and then I'll come back and visit them when we're done here. Hey, Jeff, we had a question. Yeah, so this would be a perfect time for a question. So I'm yeah, transition. well, someone was interested in whether or not you've actually found green crab out there. 
Ah, great question. And the answer, thankfully, is no. So we haven't found them anywhere um, in the south in the South Sound yet. And let me switch. Yeah, so, sorry, there we go. Yeah, so we haven't found them anywhere um, outside of the Straits of Juan de Fuca in the North Sound. So that's good. And, um, but we're definitely, it's definitely worth keeping an eye out. And actually the crabs that we saw, that I showed you at first are a really good indication that this is not a great habitat for green crab. Um, Typically, they're a shore crab, and typically the habitat that's going to be better for them is uh, what I'm going to show you here in a minute, um, where, that, where that's the dominant uh, habitat. Um, where you see the big predators like that, the Dungeness and Graceful uh, kelp crabs, they actually can outcompete uh, at times the, um, the, the green crab sort of size for size, but uh, big green crabs certainly are a problem for Dungeness and others. But uh, yeah, that's I think Carmen I saw it. Could you that? Yeah, it's Carmen. We have a question on chat. Could you speak to a little bit about why um, the green crab is problematic? Ah, great, great question. They are a voracious omnivore that aggregates in large numbers. Um, you kind of com and combine all those things um, and you add in the lack of natural predators, the lack of parasites, um, they're really free to reach huge numbers. And, um, and it's not necessarily just one or two being around that would be a problem, but when they reach their really high densities, um, they can uh, wipe out eelgrass, uh, which is a big concern because that's such an important habitat here. Um, they can also outcompete um, dungeon nests of the same size or smaller, um, and they certainly would outcompete some of the, the shore crabs. They also really like to they, to eat uh, shellfish, so they'll root around. and uh, They had severe impacts on the soft shell clam industry in the East Coast. Uh, there's been some evidence of problems with uh, steamer clams out here. Um, but there also hasn't been a ton of work into the impacts out here other than a, a decent bit on uh, eelgrass up in Canada. So it's sort of those ecological impacts kind of from the bottom up. Um, and, you know, they tend to be in these habitats that are like really nice nursery habitats as well for, um, for fish and other things we care about. So thanks. And I actually will switch a little bit to just to show you this uh, habitat. This is, um, what we would call salt, salt marsh habitat. And there's just some really cool plants here. I, I think it, it was, wasn't until I uh, worked with Peg Tillery at WSU Kitsap and she kind of turned me a little greener than uh, th and thinking more about plants than just invertebrates and seaweed. But um, really the, there's such a unique group of, I don't know, a dozen or, or more um, plants that only have this narrow band along the shoreline in which they can live. Um, a couple of the most, uh, the best known are pickleweed, which is um, something that people eat regularly, CB, um, asparagus, those are some names for it. Hopefully, hopefully you can kind of see in the photo. The, uh, and let's on this thing, some others. And, um, Sometimes it's a little bit of a, um, a gap when people go out and you know rake up uh, baskets of, of pickleweed. Um, and that's kind of a fleshy one here that has a really pretty yellow flowers. Um, and then there's, like I say, there's several other plants, some of my favorites that are coming in uh, a little higher, uh, but again, in a narrow band are the, the gumweed, which has gourd gets about waist high and has gorgeous yellow flowers, deep buds. Um, and then there's a variety of rushes um, as well as uh, just some other, other cool plants. Um, and I think we're probably gonna be running pretty short on time. So I'm gonna actually move a little bit um, down here and wanted to show you one particular character that I knew had, been up by where I was working, and that's this guy. I'm guessing many of you recognize that. 
as a sand dollar. And that's one of the one of the species that really does well in this lagoon because it has this permanent water, uh, the stable water to uh, live in. And if you zoom down on a uh, satellite map in Google, uh, you can actually see little patches, the little patches of these uh, critters on the shoreline. Uh, you'll see little dark patches, um, and they're really abundant in here. Maybe you can, yeah, you can, should be able to see those in the in the picture. And so when the water's over them, they all come up and they orient and um, uh, they filter and catch food on on uh, on tube feet. And um, we actually have a little poll if uh, Emily can pull that up. We thought we'd give this a try as part of this. Um, I'm wondering how you'd all respond to what uh, what some of the relatives of these uh, or what a closest relative out of a few options is. All right, I'm gonna try to pull it up. And Which, while you're pulling that up, the one thing I want to say about the tiger beetle is that this is the kind of habitat you'll find them in, uh, right at the, the kind of shoreline edge, especially on these hot days. They'll look like flies, uh, kind of that hop up and come down. So if you were looking for something a little different to see on the beach, um, adjust your eyes, they're only like, I don't know, a third of an inch long or something. Um, but kind of try to catch those movements and then slowly, slowly sneak up on them because they pretty much hop, hop up and fly just enough that you can't get a good look. But, uh, but they're a really cool predaceous beetle that uh, you know, lives along these habitats. It's kind of an important linkage of the uplands and the shorelines. Is everyone seeing the poll for closely related? Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Here we go. We're getting responses in. You know, you'll notice those of you familiar with these different critters, that, uh, you know, imagine what they look like and they actually kind of look, look somewhat similar to each other. But not a lot like a uh, sand dollar. All right, I'll Quick give time. a little bit more time on the poll and then I'll see if I can uh, show the results. Thanks. And a quick time check, because I can't really see it on my phone. It's 2.39. All right. Okay, let's see. Is everyone seeing the results of the poll? Looks like 50 hey. folks said orange cucumber. <laughs> Yeah, and isn't that remarkable? I mean, if those of you who are familiar with the cucumbers, they're big and squishy and and uh, and fluffy, and really, really nothing like a, a sand dollar uh, or a sea star, which they're all part of the uh, the echinoderms, the spiny skin creature. And oh, there it is. Hello. Um, and in that in the picture, especially the one on the right, you can kind of see a bunch of tube feet. That's one of those key things. Um, there's actually um, a couple of key things. One is tube feet. They all kind of share that along with urchins. And the other is the, um, the fact that they have this pentaradial symmetry, which is easy to imagine on a sea star. But next time you look at a sand dollar, um, you can see the little flower of five. And um, if you were to count these rows of tube feet, you know, or the, the arms around the mouth, you know, they're all divisible by five, which is kind of cool. It, and if you ever get a, a test of a dead, the shell of a dead, um, uh, of a dead urchin, you can actually try to count the lines and break them down and, and you'll wind up with five. So thanks for bringing that up. And actually, the next poll is, um, is one that I'm going to uh, do here in a second. Um, and actually, actually, maybe if you could pull it up now and then I'll show you the critter in, in nature. So this is a snail poll to test your snail skills. And this one might even be a little bit harder. By the way, I see the, oh, oh let's see. I think you'll need the pair first on that one, right? There Perfect. So I will relaunch. All right. Perfect. Now, if everybody. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> that was a quick look, but give it your best guess. And, um, 
And maybe we can go back to the picture after and take a take another look. And I'll show you some here in the wild too. So this is uh, the oyster drill. Uh, there's sort of an eastern east coast, an Atlantic one, and a Pacific one. Um, and here in, in this lagoon, we have the Pacific one. Okay, looks like the results of the poll. Most folks are saying C. All right, now let's go to the picture. This was a really hard one, I have to say. And uh, let's see. Perfect. And you'll see, I, I was actually kind of hoping this would happen. So C looks like a really gnarly, crazy looking snail, right? The trick is that it's actually a native called the leafy horn mouth. And it is, it does have kind of the same ribbing as the, um, as the oyster drill. And I did cheat a little bit too, because the oyster drill in that picture is pretty and worn. Um, but if you can give, uh, and then the, the two on the left are the native dog winkles. Um, the striped dog winkles, the bee and the frilled dog winkle, which again doesn't have frills, is A. But uh, the eggs also are the, um, if you know the eggs, and some of the research at the UW found that if you're going to try to control the uh, oyster drills, you can't just toss all the parents in buckets and get rid of them. You actually have to go after the egg masses as well uh, to be successful. So if you can give me back the, the image or back to my camera, that'd be awesome. All right, we got it. Cool. So first of all, there's a, there's a, a grainy hand hermit in this, in this one. Oops, there it is. But this is the shell. And the, again, I admit I cheated. The shell is actually a little more fluted than the, um, than the flattened one that I had in the picture. Um, it's looking like most of these are hermit crabs. When I was here doing the, oh, there's, there's a snail. So you see that foot. And they have an operculum, which covers the opening. And all of those snails in that picture um, have a sort of a pointy snout. And that's a, a real good indication that you're looking at a predatory snail. Um, and all of those, including the natives, are drills. You know, our natives um, feed a lot on mussels and barnacles, things like that. Um, but these guys are known for coming in with the oysters and, uh, uh, and establishing. So a couple other things at this spot. This is actually a live, um, looks like a, it's a, a live steamer clam. Uh, looks like a, a Japanese or a manila clam. Trying to look at some of the, and one of the, that one looks like a native. Yeah, so this one's nice and round. It's a pretty clear um, uh, uh, native steamer clam. But uh, this one's a little little trickier. He's kind of broad, but I, I suspect that's a, a manila. And this one looks definitely a lot, a lot uh, kind of more oblong, more colorful sometimes. Um, but it's interesting that you have these kind of sitting up here and uh, part of that's just that the water's always in but part of it is that there historically has been a lot of harvesting here uh, on the other side which I'm going to take you to now of this um, kind of artificially artificial burn the part that I'm walking on right now was the um, was historically the the actual spit but now we're going to move over to the um, to the other side. Oh, great blue heron. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. And the eagle looks like he's passed, passed out of view. But um, now I am on the windier side. Can you still hear okay? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. All right. So looking out on the bay here, this is Quartermaster Harbor. And uh, there's actually enormous um, uh, sand dollar beds right out this way. There's uh, often 
historically and up until a few years ago, there's a lot of uh, shellfish harvest that would happen here, uh, but that's been closed as part of the natural area recently. So this is kind of our last stop. And I think that's probably working pretty well with the time, but um, uh, oh, there's a gull with dropping his clam or her clam. Um, but this is our last stop. This is the spillway, and it's actually a really, um, really interesting habitat because it's supporting an enormous population of uh, ochre stars. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the sea star wasting disease that has uh, wiped out a lot of our starfish for the time being. And this is a place where um, whatever is happening, and you suspect something to do with this uh, movement of water, it's really protecting these starfish. Um, and I'll show some of them to you. And this is a really cool project that some Vashon uh, Island High School students with the support of Ashland Nature Center actually monitoring these stars um, as part of the sea star wasting uh, disease monitoring program. Um, so uh, that's something you can actually kind of dig around online, find information about. But really, really cool that uh, they're hanging on here and that leaves a nice uh, population to hopefully make lots of babies and reestablish. But here, I'll show you some, the size of some of these. These are big starfish. You can see my hand next to that, that pretty one. We actually have kind of the ochre color and then a nice redder one. Then we go all the way up to purple. Here's one. And again, big stars. The water is pretty warm, but uh, presumably some of that fast movement is really helping them. If you look here, one, two, three, four, five, a uh, bunch. Um, so a lot of starfish. Uh, you figure there's also a lot of food here. And that's the, uh, you know, the water, the moving water and the big rocks are supporting the barnacles and the uh, mussels that the sea stars are feeding on. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the eggs of the, uh, of the drills. I'll show you this rock here. These are some of the eggs. You see they're pink, which actually means they're, they're dead, but they've, uh, emptied or not, it's a different question. There's still some live ones there, but um, totally if they're turned pink like that, they actually die. Yeah, it's easy to find the parents around here on the rock. Again, these are the, uh, the Pacific oyster drills, Japanese oyster drills. Um, and I'm gonna actually pick up this rock. And I don't know if we kind of talk beach etiquette, uh, this rock is about the size or smaller than my head, so that's a good thing. We don't want to pick up rocks that are too big. One, they actually would do a lot of cutting on my hand, but but unfortunately, this really shows you how you know that there's a lot of oyster drills here. Um, this one's a little more like the one that I had in the picture, uh, a lot more worn down. This one is an example of one that has a lot more ridges, but there's other little you know, lots of other little critters hanging in here. Um, I miss looking under things and all of the cool stuff we can see. Miss sharing that with all of you. And I, I find that usually when I'm on the beach with folks that you bring me the coolest things and I'm not great at finding them myself. Um, also, I, I don't know if you noticed in my hand, I've been carrying around this beautiful shell. Uh, this is another non-native species. It's <clears throat> the purple mahogany clam or purple varnish clam. And it has this beautiful uh, brown skin on the, on the top. Periostricum is the, the name for it, um, which you don't see on a lot of our native clams. And then it has this just deep purple interior until they bleach out by the sun. They're not, they're a species that we don't actually tend to worry much about. They seem to have a slightly different niche from our native, um, native clams. We've got one of our big stars here out of water. Again, looks looks pretty healthy. There's some, you know, some kind of white here, and on the ones that are sick, you'll really start to see the see them open up with lesions, um, which are just kind of open sores. And I haven't actually mentioned seaweed at all, but there is a, a cool seaweed in here, which seems to be kind of the, the dominant 
Um, because a lot of this is the stuff you'll, you know, there's not a whole lot of unique stuff here, but um, it's just kind of fun to visit them again from our, from the comfort of our homes. But um, there's, uh, <clears throat> these are uh, both red seaweeds. This is one of the fine reds where you have the, this delicate little branches on them, lots of little, uh, it's going to be hard to see. This is really delicate plants. This one's one of the, the uh, iodine seaweeds. Um, crush it up and it has kind of a, a bleachy smell. Um, and I'm not going to tromp too much on the, on the rocks here, but I will say this is a very, very popular, or at least was, uh, recreation site. Um, when the tide switches here, you get people boating all over the place. Um, kids like to jump off of this into this pool here. Because of this structure, there's a deep plunge pool here. It's probably 15 feet deep or so, um, which is really cool on the one hand for jumping in and swimming, uh, kayaking around reasonably safely in a protected area. Um, it's also nice for, um, uh, for otters feeding. The sea otter will often swim from over there, mill around here and pick up uh, fish out of, the, out, of this, uh, out of this pool. So let's see the last, well, there's, I'll say there's, you know, mostly here it's the bar, barnacle and the mussel friends. Usually on a rock like this, there'd be three species of barnacle, the acorn barnacle, the br little brown and the, uh, and the haystack barnacle. But let's see, I was wondering if I could actually spot one of our uh, sea cucumber friends because this is the right kind of habitat. So I don't know how much you can see the orange in the photo, probably not very easily, but you know, whenever you see a really bright flash, you know, bit of orange in among rocks, almost a guarantee you've got a sea cucumber with its big, uh, big thick body tucked under the rock and all those two feet fastened on. And then uh, all those fluffy tentacles sticking out feeding. Um, otherwise. So, you know, again, this is a very artificial habitat, artificial constructed, artificially constructed. It does seem to be providing a service in terms of supporting these starfish right now, um, which is an interesting issue. Um, but these are creosote materials. The rocks are fairly unnatural in this area. And if you noticed the bulkhead as I walked over here, uh, it's large riprap. Uh, there's a refrigerator. Oh, and actually, maybe this is a good spot to finish with a, a picture of the sign. So this shows Rob's Lagoon. Uh, and since we didn't have the map, it actually shows the current structure. So if you remember the, on the on the T sheet, it showed the spit coming like this. And so they built a road and then they filled and then uh, put a dam to keep the, keep the salmon in. So we definitely change these areas over time. And there's a lot of great restoration work going on around here and all around the sound uh, by uh, agencies and nonprofits and others. So, um, anyway, that's a little introduction to um, Bob's Lagoon. Does anybody have any, uh, I don't know if we have time for a question or two. Well, I have a question. It doesn't sound like anybody's uh, typing any questions in at this moment. If you want to do the last poll. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a cute that's one. Right. Let me see if I can pull that up. Sure. While, you, while you pull that up, I see. We do have a couple questions yeah, that are coming in on chat. So artificial habitat where you know human modification has altered it in some way. Like I say, for this, for this lagoon, the fact that the water level is raised, the um, the berm is much much higher. Um, it's rockier, rather bouldery, more boulders rather than uh, cobbles, that kind of thing. Another poll for you. What do you think? And this picture actually comes from one of the naturalists. I love, love, love to get uh, pictures of other people's experiences on the beach. And 
my email is easy, jaws like the shark at uw.edu. So feel free to reach out to me. I always love to uh, share the cool experiences people have. Jeff, do you have time to take a couple questions from the chat? We have a few. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, so first one, is an oyster snail the same as a leafy hornmouth? Good question. Um, they look a lot alike. They are different species. So, so actually, our our group um, thinking on that was uh, a little off on the image. Though, like I say, I, I cheated a bit and uh, gave you a tough image to go on. But, um, but yeah, they're they're different. The leafy hornmouth has these three really big ridges that come off, and uh, whereas the oyster drill has uh, several smaller ridges. But uh, they're both really kind of gnarly. Uh, gnarly snails, uh, and it both also drills predators on other, other sea life. Um, another one: Have you seen any plainfin midshipmen? Oh, plainfin midshipmen! No, and actually, this would be a probably a spot where you might go to see them. Um, if I turn my camera, oops. And you look out here, you can see a, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of it's concrete, but a lot of bigger boulders and rocks on the, on the beach. That's exactly the kind of stuff that those deep sea fish would come up. The male would dig a burrow underneath or a nest, uh, croak away and attract a lady, and she would come in and lay her eggs, and then he would uh, tend them. And yeah, this is the, the kind of the time of year when we'd start seeing them. I, I, often the early June outings we do with, uh, school students that's a, a highlight is to see those big fish under these um, under these boulders um, and 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 their eggs um, it's also a little hard once they see one to keep them to have them practice good beach etiquette and leave all the other big rocks down but, um, but yeah great question and a, and a really cool fish um, deep sea fish that spends its breeding time in the intertidal could you speak to a little bit about what's causing the sea stars to waste? You know, I'm, um, I am not much of an authority on that. And it's kind of cool, VNC and uh, Bianca and Maria are coordinating um, uh, an expert to come and actually talk about that. Well, I guess we aren't coming anymore, but uh, to show up on Zoom and talk about that. Um, you know, my understanding is that it's um, you know, a dense virus that um, that sort of impacts them, and then once they get uh, get harmed, and the temperatures, water temperatures, seem to have something to do with it. And then once they're infected, then they are susceptible to uh, other um, other bacterial and viral infections and uh, parasites and things. So not entirely unlike what we're kind of experiencing now. We want to stay away from the one bad bug um, for the damage it does, but also the, the um, other things that can happen in association with it. Are there any lagoons close to Kitsap County you would recommend to view similar specimens? I think we lost Jeff. Uh, so we'll give him a chance to get back on. I'm sorry, sorry, I dropped off everybody, but, um, and did everybody get the octopus? Uh, everybody gets the <laughs> octopus. Someone did ask about what size. Yeah, I think it's just sort of like pinky nail size. That was a little tiny one. Um, so, yeah, it's not, obviously not developing all of its color and stuff yet. Um, but it also, it, which made it look kind of squiddy. So, it's, uh, <laughs> The fish would have been a stretch, but I, I could see that too. Um, but it looks yeah, like I we have one unanswered question left on the chat. If you had a second, just to quickly sure. take that one. Um, I've, there, I've got time. But. Are there any lagoons close to Kitsap County you would re recommend to view similar specimens? Oh yes, um, and in fact, the on Bainbridge. Um, the head of Blakely Harbor has the exact same kind of rocky sill as Rob's Lagoon does. Um, and I don't know if anybody's watching uh, starfish there, but I bet I remember when I was there last, there were uh, quite a few. So it's maybe kind of that s similar effect. Um, so that's one. And it, it's not quite like this one, but it, again, some similar features. 
um, and probably some similar critters. And there is a, a, a crab team monitoring site there, and thanks to the team that's out there. The um, the other um, the other one that comes to mind on Kitsap uh, is Nick's Lagoon, which is one out at Seabeck. You can see it from kind of the pizza place in Seabeck. Um, and it's a it's kind of a really small county park, but it's it's just a nice place to go sit and relax. Pretty different critters, but you can definitely, especially the the salt marsh habitat, you can really experience there. Um, beyond those two, um, none are coming immediately to mind. Though I'm I'm sure there are quite a few. That I'm sure that there are a few around. Some are probably on private property as well. Um, but uh, definitely those are two public ones on either side of the county you could go check out. And thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. Well, Amy, do you want to, I, I certainly appreciate everybody participating and thanks for giving the opportunity to share. Yeah, thank you everyone for participating. I, I went through the clo my closing announcements while we were <laughs> offline. <laughs> so we're all good. All right. <laughs> so we're all good. So I, I was passing it over to you and Excellent. yeah, it was, it was a very great experience, Jeff. Thanks for uh, taking this on. Yeah, well, thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody's in person at some point. <laughs> yes, for sure. All righty. We'll yeah. sign out. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot.